Psalms 108, verses 3 and 4 says, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people, and I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. Stand with me and sing number 267. I know whom I have believed. please open up our service with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us gather here today to give you praise and glory and be with our campers this week as they go camping and may they learn a lot from thy word and may they uh, have a good time doing so and keep the temperature not too hot for them. Uh, be with our missionaries as they do their jo uh, jobs and uh, Thank you for all that you have given us. As we pray through Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. I'd love it if the Lord would send a cool front just for their sake. <laughs> well, I believe in miracles, but <clears throat> I also live in Texas, so it's okay. <clears throat> I know what it's like. We are earlier in the year, remember, we were getting all those fierce winds you know, that come in the spring. Uh, I moved here in 77, and uh, the next spring, the 78 spring, um, circumstances had beyond my control. Somebody broke in and stole all my tools, so I didn't have any. So I went to work on throwing trash on the back of a garbage truck till I could get enough money to buy tools. And uh, the... The only job he had was hand loading. I don't know if you've ever hand loaded, but they grocery stores understand they can sell pasteboard. So they don't, they don't want to throw it away. Now they pack it in bundles and okay. And then they paid some fool to pick it out by hand and throw it in the back of a packer truck and pack it in there. And it was so frustrating. You say, how do you, how do you remember? I remember it wasn't, they said, well, March is usually really bad in April and in May and June. And it, it, you, when you tried to throw the pasteboard into the packer, it would blow away. And so it took a couple of people running after it. Yeah, I've seen it quite windy and we've seen it quite hot here. So it'll get that way. By the way, in case you're wondering, look the next time they say the record high temperature, it was probably set in the early 20s. Somewhere when that, during the 20s and remember how hot it got and get again in the 30s. We had this dust bowl problem with our neighbors up north. Okay, the, the, I'm not sure how many people in America had even had an air conditioner running in the 20s. I didn't know what a, I didn't know what an air conditioner was. We 
we didn't have an air conditioning car when everybody else had one. So my dad made us roll up the windows in the car and ride around and scream at us not to sweat. You know, much <laughs> look cool in there, amen. So we got to impress the neighbors. But that was not actually the truth, but because uh, half of us were riding in the trunk anyhow. <laughs> so do you know that you can get 10 kids in a 1953 two door Ford? If you put part of them in the trunk, you can. You can do it. You can do it. But anyhow, with all that said, that's much fun. Now, can you imagine the day we live in having half your kids in the trunk of the car? You would be sent to, you could, you can, you could do almost anything, but you know what I mean? You can't do that. You're not allowed to spank them. You go to prison for that. But boy, you're putting them in the deal. Oh, I'm not kidding. No, it's a whole big deal. Look how it warped us. It really, really did. I'm here pastoring a church. So God is good. We're looking forward to it and camp. We're excited about that and, and taking, we're taking a lot of young people that have never been to camp. It's going to be quite an experience for them. First time I went as a camper, I was a pastor. The first time I ever went to a camp, I was a pastor. Okay. And so it was, I, I was thinking the whole time the first year, Somebody would have sent me to a church camp when I was a kid. I'd have probably got saved. It makes a big difference. I, I know they're a little harder today than we were then, but God still works. We'll talk about that today when I'm preaching, okay? But right now, we're going to remind you that we that women's prayer circle goes on in, in August, and then we have <clears throat> changed our fifth Sunday sing to the fourth Sunday. So on the 24th, we'll be singing on Sunday nights, and that's primarily all that we're going to do. But I need you to sing for us, okay? The, we like to sing in the quartet, and we like to do those things, and people are going to play, and it would be nice, and my grandkids will have something together, and the teens will do something, I'm pretty sure, and we'll work on that. But we do, Because of camp, we only got a little time to do that, so you got to help us out a little bit. Show up here and say, you know what? I haven't ever told you all these years, but I am an accomplished pianist. And, <laughs> And we'll let you play, okay? Whether you are or not, right. And then remember that coming up after that, of course, we have just the normal rest of the year, kids getting ready, and they'll be back in school before you know it. I don't know when it starts, but it's sometime in August, isn't it? The 15th, so just a few weeks after we get back, it'll be time to get ready going back to school. And we have some back-to-school programs, things we're going to talk to you about, and some missions of the events that we want to talk to you about. There is a ladies' meeting coming up. Um, when in September 9 and 10, uh, you can talk to Miss Jenner or my wife, Cheryl, and see what she thinks about that. I think part of them are going over on Friday night because they sort of have to. And then the, some of them are going over on Sunday. It's all, it's just in Mesquite, so we don't have to spend the night and just drive back and forth. And then I want you to pray for all the people on our prayer list. Miss Allison is, and I talked to her, she said, uh, she thought they were going to have to take her eye out because it was it was hurting so bad, but they got it calmed down. She got an eye infection of all the things that you could get with cancer treatment. You could, get. <laughs> I don't know how the two are conjoined together, but somehow or another, somebody with something on their hand or her, one of the others touched her eye. So she spent a long time in that. She's at home doing well. She's excited about the other, and she's doing marvelously well. If you do, do did you read her? Her prayer request that went out today, she, she was bragging about how well she is, and and, and, and <clears throat> I'm glad. God did some great things for her. He really did. And, and when you pray, sometimes you don't, you're not thinking about what God could do and what he will do. One of the great things he did is he, he caused something in her life to keep her from getting out of a hospital. And they found this cancer. And because they couldn't get the first little goofy problem fixed, it was just low salt, low sodium. She got to stay in the hospital and her treatment started not weeks off or months off or coming back in six weeks or 10 weeks or 12 weeks. It started the next day. That's the way God does stuff when enough of God's people pray about it. Then Brother Bill has some special prayers. If you've been looking on that, you might want to, Keep his family in, in the prayer list and uh, ask God to take care of them as well. Right now, we're going to ask you to pray with us. We'll pray. Always want to pray for our missionaries and we want to pray for our missions works. I have not contacted many of them this week. I will tell you that uh, 
we, we're, we're, we're excited about them getting back. Some of them still have special needs like getting their visas and American citizenship for a kid born overseas and all that stuff that works with it. Some of them are, are having trouble on their fields with just trying to get restarted in their missions works. Uh, I'm, I told you this morning, I've never understood how you could be gone a whole year. Some of them have been gone two years because of the COVID. I don't, I don't see where they'd be hardly, I think you'd have to go back and start all over again. You know what I mean? You might find one person or two there, but pray for them. That's discouraging. And I, we don't want them to quit. Some of our retired missionaries, uh, I won't say anything about who or what, but some of our retired missionaries, we support our retired missionaries when they come home. They spent most of their life, 25, 30, 35 years on the foreign mission field. And I'm not cutting them off because they don't have anything here. Some of them have families. More than half of them don't have families. Okay. And we, we've run into a problem with a couple of them who are retired that there's missions agencies. Somehow there's a problem with them getting their money. And I don't understand it. We've actually got involved in it. We'll keep being involved in it. And until we figure out what to do with it, but you just things that you don't think about after all those years being on a field, they come back here with no home and in the latter part of their life, most of them are not healthy um, by then. And they're depending on what we put in for them over that they take a portion of it to keep back for their retirement and to get back and find out it's not there. And so we, we've continued. I don't know how many we have 12, 10 or 12 that are retired. So I'm like that easy 10 maybe a couple more because most of us as pastors just can't cut them off. You know, we, we feel like we owe them something for going where we couldn't go. And so that's what your missions money does. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace. Nobody's out of your sight, Lord, nobody. But Lord, for some reason, I have never understood it. I just know what you said, that if we will pray, you'll answer. And Lord, I talked to a man today who said that, He had the worst answer ever from God, and that was not right now. And I guess that's not what we wanted to hear. We're always so used to your answering things we say with a yes and an okay that, Father, we're surprised when it doesn't almost immediately come to pass. Thank you, Lord, for that kind of confidence that we can have in a God who hears us when we pray. We ask you, Lord, to be at our missionaries, everyone. We have so many. Lord, to name them all would take a minute, would take an hour. Lord, I pray that you'd bless in every area, in every field, in every circumstance. And Lord, we pray for these special things we've mentioned as well, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me and sing number 285, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Oh. No, that's okay. Very good. You know how to do lean.
may be seated. We'll have an ensemble of girls coming to sing this evening. Got my microphone turned on now, and I said I love it when the young people do stuff. We have an involved group, and I'm excited about that, and I want them to stay involved. And uh, they have the tragedy of having a youth director who has <clears throat> no, what's the word? No. I, that was my helper. <laughs> And uh, one of us is still a kid, and the other us isn't. So uh, anyhow, I, I was going to say he's he's not uh, very tolerant of the people that say, you know, here's why I can't. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and part of you have learned this from me. From of you that are adults can verify this. I figured all my life, if you can learn something, I can learn something. I may not be as talented as you are with what you do. I may not have the physical ability you do. But if, so, if somebody else can do it, I can do it. You help me, you teach me, you work with me, I can do it. You know, and, and if your excuse is that I'm just too stupid to do anything, then that should apply in everything in your whole life, right? See, I don't think there's anybody out like that. Most of us have great talents and great abilities and Sometimes God does some wonderfully special things with special people that's amazing to me. I'm always, I can find out whoever won any race or what they're doing and what place there is by asking Jason any time I want. I'm amazed at that. He knows every racetrack in the whole country and where they're doing and what's going on. Sometimes I just ask him so I can impress my friends because I don't go <laughs> to those things. But we've been talking to you about Bible doctrine. And uh, there's not any kind of reason that you can't understand that doctrine. And when Jesus told them, and I'm not going to turn to the verse, but you understand. He said, beware of the of the leaven of the Pharisees. And of course, it was right after the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. And uh, do you all know what he, why they fed 4,000 and 5,000? What, why did he just get them together? They were, uh, well, there were two different groups of people. All right, the 5,000 
were supposedly those Jewish people who had adhered to the biblical Old Testament covenant. They had not really, but they thought they were. That was important. And they had stayed kind of separated from the other peoples who inherited the area, including the Samaritans. Most of the Samaritans were at least part Jewish in the time of Christ. There were not very many of them who were not, who didn't have some kind of Jewish blood in them. You say, well, you can't prove that. I bet you I can. Okay. Those people, and, and when the Lord fed the 5,000, it was, it's an amazing thing. If you've never been to Israel, you should go there at least once in your lifetime. But in those places they have set up, it's like almost a natural amplitorium. You got 5,000 men plus women and children. So there's probably 20,000 people he fires with, feeds with five loaves and two fishes. And then takes up more than he had to start with. Twelve baskets full. I'm thinking that the kid who was selling fish sandwiches that day they started with started a restaurant when they drove <laughs> off, okay? Because they had no more than got out on the ocean, in the ocean, on the lake, than they said, we forgot to bring bread. Because he, he made a statement. Beware of the leaven. And they said, well, we, we must have left. We didn't bring any bread. He's, he's rebuking us for not bringing bread. And finally, after a couple of times of them talking to themselves, he goes, don't you understand? I'm talking about the Pharisees' doctrine, their doctrine. And they went, oh, yeah, we knew that. You know, it's like we are. And what's doctrine? And, what, and though we use the word a lot, we don't always understand exactly what it means. But it is the adhered practice that we agree to, our doctrine. Our doctrine is Bible doctrine. And I've had people say, you know, preacher, where do you, where do you, what do you, what, where do you teach people how to be a Baptist? Real Baptists don't teach anything about being a Baptist. You either are one or you're not. Okay. It's because of the practice we have. Not everybody that practices exactly like this calls us by the same name. But I'm telling you that your doctrine is not just what you believe. It's what you believe and practice. Okay? <clears throat> and so when we're talking about Bible doctrine, we talked about last week, it's steadfast. That means it doesn't change. Remember, me? I ended up my sermon saying it's the same thing in America, it has to be the same work the same way in Singapore. It has to work the same way in China. It has to work the same way every place else. What 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 it really is a doctrine? It has to be a doctrine. In the first church that I worked at, <clears throat> the pastor and I had several different agreements, and uh, one of them, of course, was ridiculous. But the other one was that he didn't. He had this deal about. Pants. It was a huge church. I told you how big it was. He had on every door, there were 12 doors to the main auditorium. 12 double sets of double doors. So there's 24 doors to this building. On every door was a sign bigger than this pulpit area. It said, ladies, no pants allowed. Dresses only. On every one of those doors. You say, well, well, I wouldn't go there. Well, I know you, you wouldn't, but about six or 7,000 other people did. It fit well for the time. I'm thinking about putting a sign on my door that says, ladies, come dressed, please. Okay. All right. <clears throat> that would help me a whole lot. But I, 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 do you understand that? And I never, I, I was not saved until I was older, but I had been all around the world. Guys, and that that doesn't fit all around the world. If it is really a, a an absolute Bible doctrine, then it has to fit everywhere. You can't change from one group to the next to the next group. You know, in America this is accepted, but in Portugal it won't work, or in the middle of Saudi Arabia it won't work. It is. Not, not many men in Saudi Arabia until this, the last few generations, wore any pants at all. So it didn't work there. It didn't work in China. It didn't work in Korea. It didn't work in Vietnam. It didn't work anyplace else. It, wasn't, it didn't work. 
Should I, do I think you ought to dress like a lady? Absolutely. You say, but, you know, pants are, you know, are so form fitting. No, over tight pants are form fitting. If you get looser ones, you won't notice it. If you wear bibbed overhauls, we won't even be able to tell. All right. See, you say, well, then when you start that stuff and you say, well, you know, nobody should be able to wear pants because it's form fitting. So you're going to make them all quit wearing anything that form fits? Now watch it before you say yes. You say, well, get looser ones. Okay, we, then we decided we could fix it by wearing culottes, which was pants with big legs which were terribly immodest. When we played softball at Bethel, my, my company sponsored softball teams, and there would be churches that play with us that would demand their ladies wear culottes while they're playing softball. I want you to understand, there's no way to ladylike do anything on a softball field much, because culottes are not. I would just think that did have been better off with pants, okay? Let's, let's put it that way, all right? There's a whole bunch of things in it. And we'd had a discussion about it. And then, of course, one of the reasons that we had a discussion is because he's reprimanding us because somebody had the audacity to have a picture taken, one of the staff members, at the beach with shorts on. And he told us that we, that, you know, that we are on his staff, we belong to him. And then he said this one thing. If you can't wear it in church, you shouldn't be wearing it. Now, see, the only problem with that is this guy that's on the staff, he's too stupid to keep his mouth shut. And he's thinking. So out loud, I said, well, that shoots pajamas in the head, don't it? <laughs> now, see, if he had lived this day, he'd have seen people wearing their pajamas to church. <laughs> you know, but this is not Walmart. You, can't, you shouldn't wear them here, all right? That's a Walmart dress code. Well, it didn't go over big, and then so as soon as I was looking for a job. But anyhow, to work out. But it's true. Okay, if, if you have something that's an absolute and you say it's a standard. Now, if we want to, we can say our church only wants people to wear red clothes. Or our people, our church, we can do anything we want because we have the privilege of being whatever we are. But at the same time that we make some kind of rule like that, number one, somebody has to enforce it. Number two, we exclude people out of our church for some reason that it is not biblical. You can't get your hair cut. You can't dye your hair. You can't do... See, none of those things or... It doesn't say that in there. The woman's hair... I was looking at the young ladies in our church how this morning, just sitting out, and how the different ones had their hair done and combed and stuff and how that in the Scripture says the woman's hair is her glory. And I believe it because they spend a lot of time, a lot of money, and it impresses me how well they do with what they do. That's a That's a tremendous thing. All right? I'm leery of a guy who spends that much time on his hair, okay? I don't want him sitting next to me too close. I just don't. So, and that's probably not biblical either, but I have a reason for it. But if all the Bible steadfast, I better be preaching, has to be based upon the commands of the Lord. And that, and the Lord said this. He said, they said, when are we going to have the kingdom set up? And he didn't say, well, I'll tell you when. He said, he just ignored it. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the ability to reach the world with the gospel instead. And he said, you start right where you are and move out to the whole world and it's done. It's based on the commands of God. It's based on the word of God. We can, we can look at that without any kind of problem. And so we're, we have no problem understanding what Peter would say, you know, that for everybody, without anybody out. Acts chapter 17, verse two, provable but by the scriptures. That's exactly what Paul did. He did he, over and over. He could just take the word of God and prove what it was. You say in the Old Testament, you know, nobody ever had a dog for a pet. Nobody used dogs for anything. That's not true. Or in the New Testament. And you just made that up. Somebody in college seminary told you that and you repeat it all the time. Because the oldest book in the Bible tells us that Job had sheep dogs. He said, that guy is so worthless. If I didn't have to, I wouldn't even let him keep my sheep dogs. So evidently it was true they had dogs for lots of stuff besides just picking up trash. 
And Paul said in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now, we have some serious issues facing us today in our churches. One of those things that's gone way out of place is faithfulness in church services. Yet we have verses all through our Bible and one specific in the New Testament saying, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Say, I don't have any problem saying that ought to be uh, a practice of everybody that knows the Lord is to be in the Lord's house and be a part of a local body. You say, well, I don't like your church. Well, go someplace else then. But somewhere go out there and get involved in the church and serve the Lord through a local body. We can do things that are tremendous. See, the church is a doctrinal thing. We have a, we have the ability to do something absolutely wonderful. Every every time we all get together, I've been, I'm going to use missions here because it's easy to do. When we send somebody something, it isn't just from George, and it isn't from this guy over here. We can sometimes do that. But I'm impressed when a people get together and we send it out through the church. You know who gets the glory for that? The one whose church it is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's what we're supposed to be telling people on the foreign field and our home fields. It's God that we worship, first of all. Now, corrupt doctrine begins anytime Christians leave behind the Scripture. It has to be based on the Scripture. And sometimes we get answers way before we get a question. It's not a problem of that being a problem. And, now, and I've told you this, and I never had any problem with it. Read it through my Bible the whole time, and all of you guys, we, we're scientific-minded. We're far out there. We read. We don't just skip over stuff. We absorb it. We retain it. We learn it. We put it in our minds. Oh, sorry, wrong crowd. But anyhow, <clears throat> we do. 30 years ago, 25 years ago, we were worried that somebody was going to clone a human, remember? Because they started cloning animals, which is not really, it's way cheaper just to have a human with the human the way it's supposed to do than just trying to clone a sheep or anything else. I think that sheep ended up costing about $20 million. Okay, You can't hardly be a sheep raiser with every sheep and have to sell it for eight, right? Dollars. <laughs> not eight million. Okay, so, okay, you could do that. It's just not a feasible thing. But we were worried about cloning humans. And when you asked, they asked me, my pastor friend said, what, do you think those, those clones will have a soul? Well, yeah, the first one did. When I said that, they thought, I figured they'd laugh and go, oh, yeah. And they said, how do you know that? Well, because Eve was a clone. He took the... the Cells and the bone cell. What do you think of took a bone? He wanted the same blood type and the same cellular structure. And he wanted the same DNA and he wanted all that stuff that you know now. They didn't know then. The Bible's way ahead of its time. And he made a woman out of her. And she had the same. It was a woe man. Right? A woe man. Right? And that's, they said that's what Adam said. The first time he looked at it, he went, whoa, man. Mm. I think that's true. Probably did. She was the most beautiful woman on the face of the earth. <laughs> Amen. But I guarantee you sometime in those early years, you probably thought Adam was cheating on her. Somewhere. Let me tell you this. She had a soul, didn't she? Okay, we don't... Our doctrine doesn't require us to get rid of science, not true science. You'll find the New Testament, them saying, you know, that science falsely so-called. I don't have to put up with that. But real science is found in the Scripture over and over and over, okay? Paul told us, Peter told us, and he says this, take heed to yourself. This is Paul in Acts chapter 20. He's coming back through, and he's not ever coming back again, and he's stopping telling this is last time to see him. And he said, I'm done here and I'm on my way and I'll probably never see your face again. Take heed there to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. What would you feed them? Well, you'd feed them the bread, the word of life, right? You'd feed them the word of God. Now look what he said. For I know this, 
You, did you notice he didn't say, I think? You know what I think? He said, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. Now, we have a trouble with sometimes with people coming from without. The church's biggest problems is what happens from within. Also of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. You know, I'm the Lord's disciple. I have, I have a group that over and over has tried to get me to join the group. and I don't particularly like the way they have to worship their leaders. So I told them, I said, you know what, guys, I already have one God. I don't need another one. I like the God I got. Apostasy began. Peter wrote it in the book of Second Peter. Apostasy is when you fall away. To fall away, to be apostate. But there were false prophets also among the people that was in the Old Testament. Even shall there be false teachers among you, look, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. None of them are going to stand up with a sign and say, I'm here to corrupt you. And they're going to start out one or two at a time. And they are really good at, at division. <clears throat> damnable. What's that word mean? What's a, what is a, what's a heresy? It's an unscriptural teaching, okay? What is a damnable heresy? It's something that would send you to hell if you believed it. You don't have to trust Christ. You just got to be good. What about Jesus is really not the Son of God? It really wasn't the sacrifice that all those things are damnable heresies because they keep men and women from being able to go to heaven. Even denying the Lord that bought them. It's not him. Then who is it? There's folks out there who practice and teach and preach and teach that Jesus is no more than one of the higher angels, but it's not even the highest one. He's just an angel. They're all over this area, all over the place. They think he's a created one. And my Bible says he's the creator of all things, that he made everything. Without him was not. They bring upon themselves swift destruction. That's bad enough. And many shall follow their, that word pernicious. It means malefant, malicent. It means wrong. It means underhanded. It means ungodly. It, and it just goes on and on. Pernicious. But it's one of those things that's done in secret. It's, a, it's getting it in before you realize what they've done. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. Through covetousness shall they with feign, that word means fake words, fake words make merchandise of you. You're worth what you can provide them. And that's, that's as far away from any Bible doctrine that I know because you have eternal value. I believe the Lord Jesus would have died for you if you'd have been the only one who ever trusted him. I wouldn't have done it like he did. I wouldn't have. Because he paid for the sins of the whole world. And then he said, anybody that wants it? Well, how many, what percentage wanted it? He died for everybody. You know what I'd have done? <clears throat> I'd have said, everybody wants to get saved, line up, and I'm taking that, and that's it. See, but that's not what the Lord did. Every sin in the whole world is paid for. It's hard to listen, guys, when you're talking and laughing. <clears throat> they're pernicious ways. And it says, with feigned words, they're, they're not real. <coughs> Make merchandise of you, because they benefit from it, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, their damnation slumbereth not. All those people have to answer to God for that somehow, some way. And you say, well, God will take care of them. He will. But what about all the people they keep away from Jesus? See, that's my deal. Three things Paul told Timothy to do. Doctrine is, in, in doctrine, is proving doctrine. Excuse me. I got I wrote the wrong thing on the top up here. Three things Paul told Timothy to do to prove 
doctrine is eternally important. That's what it should say up there. Number one, let no man despise thy youth, be thou an example of believers, the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Number one, I don't care if you're a teenager. I don't care if you're six years old or 12 years old or 89 years old. You're still responsible for reaching people with the gospel. You say, doesn't matter what I do. You know what I have in my life? Everybody I've ever witnessed to never got saved. Y'all know that? I witnessed to a guy here this week, and he was telling me that, you know, that he kept trying to get away from grace and sin, but tell me how good of works he was doing. And that everybody in his whole family was good workers, and they always had been good workers, and they did this. And Well, I'm try- I'm, tremend- I'm glad, okay, in keeping traditions. The Lord had some about that. I'll get to a little bit later, but probably not tonight. <clears throat> but sometimes, see, the gospel works this way. I'm not responsible for saving everybody. I am responsible, number one, for telling everybody and then living in a way that doesn't keep them away for what I teach them. See, those are the two things. That's all I got to do is tell everybody about Jesus and live so that I don't keep them from believing what I say. And he's telling Timothy, okay, you're young. Be an example of what every believer is supposed to be like. But have you ever noticed that Christians have an, have an exclusion in every age group? They're too young. They're too busy. They're too fun. They're this. They're too old. They're too they're, Have you ever noticed that we, we divide up into groups and we use our age as a reason not to serve Jesus? Y'all are even laughing at that. That's true. There's no reason. And then we do other stuff. We purposely set up obstacles in our lifetime where we keep really busy doing all the worldly things we want to do, and we rule God out. I'll tell you a formula I've used all my life. You ready? I grew up on a farm, and my desire one day was to get a job where I had the weekends off. I have never had a job where I got the weekends off. I don't care about that right now. But I want you to get this. You have a responsibility as a person, young person, older person, or anybody else, to know that what you say reaches people. Now, when I first got saved, I decided to witness to everybody I could, friend, foe, or whatever else. And one of those people that I had witnessed to at the time I witnessed to them totally rejected it. Didn't want anything to do with that. And then I moved into full-time ministry and moved from the church to the children's home was working. Cheryl came down. I met her. We're talking a year and a half, two years into this time. And we're, we're getting ready to go to Melbourne to take a children's home of our own together and to get a call on the Christmas before that from the guy that I witnessed to three or four or five years ago. And I did it every night, by the way, because we rode to work together. Did he call me from California? He'd called home, called my parents, figured out how to get a hold of me. We didn't have a phone where we, they had to call us and it was weird. You know, tomorrow night I want to call back at the children's home. We didn't all have phones in it. There wasn't anything called a cell phone, okay? Only Dick Tracy had that then, so... (laughs) We didn't have that. But he called and tell me that somebody in California had witnessed to him. And he said, I finally understood what you was trying to tell me. And I wanted to call and tell you that you didn't waste your time. 
talking to me. All right, now, how many of those people that we witness to actually take the time to call us back? Hardly any would. Some of them can't even remember what our names were. This guy did because I rode with him to work every night. Okay, I was still in the military working at a plant, and, and we had lived just a few miles from each other. We drove the 35 miles together, and, and I witnessed to him. We would have rode with the other guys, but they smoked and stuff, and we didn't want to be in the car. All right? But I'm telling you, so you don't know that. How many people come back later to hear the gospel? Because you're responsible. See, nobody is despised your youth. That's a, that's a great doctrine. But see, we've created our own doctrine. Whatever age group we are in, we're, we don't have to do that because we're exempted. Amen. Insert it here. Amen. Number two, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Reading the word of God. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Somebody said on the radio while ago, I was listening to a preacher, and he reminded me how many hours there are in a week. He had a, a kid pull out a tape measure across the stage on the radio. You know, I didn't see it. I was just listening to him. And he pulled it out 168 inches. And they said, this is how far 168 inches are. Why would you pull a tape measure out 168 inches to prove a point? That's the number of hours in a week. 168 hours. If you just tithed on your time, how much of your time would belong to God? 16.8 hours, right? How much is he really getting? We say, well, God has no right to ask that. <laughs> Amen? It is your time. It is your money. It is your life. It is your, and God will never take that from you. But he said, till I come, you want to be the guy that's leading people, Timothy? You want to be the pastor of a church? Then you've got to be an example. Uh, come give attendance to reading. Read your Bible. Read your Bible more than you read anything else. I have a good, I have a brother-in-law. He likes to read. He gave me a book. And he gave, it's, it's about Daniel Boone. And the first three chapters are about all the Indian tribes. Very interesting. Then with all of his footnotes, He's one of the newfangled guys because he figured out that what really happened with climate change, it started when the colonialists came to America and cut down the forest. And so the next, like two decades later, they were having super freezes in parts of the world, and they caused that by cutting down those forests. That's the, well, that, it must work because if we cut them down and they had the freezes, We've planted hundreds of billions of trees in America that weren't here. Maybe that's why the climate temperature is going up. we got too many trees. That's not good science, and it's not biblical either. Okay? But I will tell you this. One of the things that lacked when they come to America was they came here for the God. And that's good. They wanted to serve God. But 90% of them neglected the fact that Indians have souls too. One of the things they should have done, and a lot of them did now, we've, we've put out missionaries all over. They should have been concentrating on reaching them with the gospel. It would have been a lot easier than fighting wars. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that's in thee. Evidently you have a gift of preaching, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the Presbyterian. Those two words, one is prophecy, and Presbyterian is any group of people that get together and send somebody out that's, that it comes from you, the Presbyterian. That's all it means. It has nothing to do with Methodist or Presbyterian. It's just that particular, that's what it means. That somebody helped us. I didn't get where I am by not getting around somebody that helped us. I've been fortunate in my lifetime, to be around some really great, wonderful people. And I tell you all the time, I'm the Forrest Gump of Christianity. And, and you, anybody not know what that means? 
You say, he says that all the time. What's that mean? Do you ever notice in the Forrest Gump, he was dumber than a stick, but he got to meet all these famous people all the time and be involved in their life and all that? That's me. I got to be involved with all those people, and I know people that, that I shouldn't have never known or ever met. And if anybody's here that's older than me, you know, that I know John and Bill Rice. I knew them really well and talked to them personally and spent time with them. Part of you don't know who that is. I got training under Dr. Peter Ruckman. Personal training, one-on-one. I got soul winning training from Rock Royer after he retired as the coach for the Navy. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. So how did I don't know? I just God put me there and I was around those people and all the things that went with it. I used to brag about the Van Empies, but since he went weird on us, I don't tell anybody I know him anymore, amen. Him and Rex Ella, Jack Van Impey and Rex, both played accordions. And they would come over to our trailer and play the accordion. But anyhow, that was, I figured out later on, in heaven you play the harp if you go, no, I'm not going to say that, but anyhow, <laughs> it, it would be someday else. Okay, but <clears throat> I will tell you that. But I'll tell you, he put into me the ability to, rem- to learn Scripture. You know why? Because the guy could quote whole Bible books. I've been with him in public where he started without the book of Romans and quote it word for word and preach out of it all the way through it without ever looking in his Bible. I didn't know that many verses. You learn something from that. Then number three, meditate on these things. Spend some time thinking about it. I'm not a, I'm not a very good movie person. I like them old TV shows with the Cowboys because there's really only 20 minutes or so, and then it's over. And the bad guy does a bad thing, the good guy does the good thing, and the bad guy loses, and the good guy wins, and every one of them. And it just has different people coming in. But I want you to understand, I'm not much of a, of a, of a TV watcher. I haven't watched any regular TV in years and years and don't want to. Oh, you don't know what you're missing. I do, because you're telling me all the time. <clears throat> what do you think the Scripture says? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, we went the other night to visit a lady in the hospital, me and Cheryl and Jana. We all went down together. Remember that? Well, they're over here sitting on the couch, and she, the lady's in the bed here, and they got me in a chair that's facing like this. And they got this TV big as this up there in the hospital. And I'm there trying to hold it because it was a porno show on their television in the hospital. You say, no way. When you take all your clothes off, it's, it's a porno show. I don't care. You say, no, no, preacher. That's the young and the whistless. You know? I don't know what that is, but it's porno. Okay, I don't care what it is. And you know, then I asked Oswald, could you turn that off? Nobody knew how to turn the thing off. And so we're in public and nobody paid attention. Not one nurse came in. So, oh, that's weird. Not even, you know. I kind of figured, what are you watching? What are you watching? You say, well, that's not PG 13. I don't, I'm kind of worried about that, guys. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them. You are going to start practicing what you watch and keep and read and study and follow after. I promise you, you will. You will. That thy profiting may appear to all. Now, here's the great thing. You ever wonder, you're, you're privy to some really personal information of the preachers. All of you parents out there, how would you like to be where I'm at right now? Watch me. Watch what I do. 
Watch who I support. I'm telling you, you say, well, how do you do that? See, that's my profiting. I have a God who comes alongside. And I take it all to him. Ask Cheryl how many times in these last month or two. We close out sometimes hours, but every day. Just turn it over to God. I, I don't know what to do anything else about it. I don't know what to do with it. Part of you are just like me, guys. Your parents, you're, there's no worldly answer for what they need and what they have to have. The sicknesses that you go through, the tragedies that we come across. See, everybody can make it when it's good, but most I've never seen anybody make it through the life, this life unscathed. Have you seen anybody do that? Every one of us. Cheryl and I were talking about we were listening to these old gospel songs and every one of them about how much sorrow is in the world and every one of them is at least 40 years old. It hadn't got better. I'm not talking about, you know, you serve God, you get rich and famous. I'm talking about you serve God, you have peace of mind and peace of heart and peace with God that you're profiting. Hey, guess what? How do you do it? You know why I've done it as a pastor all these years? And if you think you, I don't get attached to you guys, you're crazy. You guys get attached to your cat. I get attached to y'all. I tell other preachers, you know what my members did? You know, they did the cutest stuff the other day. It was just really cute what they did. You know? One of them's on the counter. And you know, but <clears throat> Every time one of you passes away or dies over these years, you don't think I don't lose a little piece of my heart with you? Do we get attached to you? How do you do that? Because I'm absolutely sure when you know Christ as Savior, you go to a better place. And there's times that I've asked God, let them go. You know what I mean? There's no point in them suffering. Good here. That your profiting may appear to all. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself. Now watch it. And them that hear thee. See how important this doctrine issue is? And that we follow it, keep it, we live it, we practice it. I'm not just ensuring myself. <clears throat> I'm ensuring the other people. This is real. And you have it as much the opportunity as I do. And, and I want to do that. I want to do that till I die. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for people that understand what I'm talking about. Thank you, Lord, for the godly Christian men and women that have been a part of my life from the time that I was first saved. A lot of them have gone on to heaven, but Lord, the residual stays alive in men and women just like me who learn from them. And we learn to practice the things of God and the things of the Holy Word from them. They helped us to learn, to study, to, to be included into our life. And I pray, Father, that tonight, when tomorrow night, the next night, but especially in this series, we understand that, Lord, we have one thing to do, and that's to learn the Word of God enough that we know who you are, understanding who we are, and know how we're supposed to live the Christian life that pleases you in a world that don't want anything to do with you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. Please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for what a great God that you are, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the, the love you have for us, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, help us, Lord, to, to stay in your word. Help us, Lord, to have it ready in our minds and in our hearts, Lord. 
and have it ready to, to share when opportunities present themselves. Lord, help us, Lord, to, to be ready, Lord, with your word to, to give to someone who needs to hear it. And uh, Lord, help us, Lord, to, to live that life, Lord, where our, our walk matches our talk, where our testimony stays strong, and that we're able to be good witnesses for you, Lord. And Lord, I love you, and I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.